So I thought this was a really interesting example in a study of international relations. Um, and so I did um, previous research um, readings, and then um, I found that the success factors of Hallyu were really um, in line with beyond the national interest type of public diplomacy because, um, so as I said before, East Asians felt some kind of um, cultural proximity for Korean made products because um, it's a mix of traditional and um, contemporary and at the same time Western and Asian. So it's like they kind of identified more with the Korean cultural products rather than, um, let's say, American products. So um, it kind of shows the regional factor and also digitalization of the construction made it go further than state level. And um, again, the transnational networks um, enabled by digitalization um, made it uh, possible, so, so showing signs of regionalization again. Um, and as for the effects of Hayu, it's like really um, in line with previous national interests in both culture and economic areas. Uh, first, it enhances national brand of Korea because um, Korea used to be so unknown country and um, but after Korean wave got so popular, people started knowing about Korea and like, they wanted to come to Korea after watching it. So um, it really did help it, um, having this national brand among foreign publics. And also it um, promoted kind of national pride among Koreans because we always imported cultural products before, but then right now like suddenly all the foreign people like Korean um, media and Korean stars and kind of it's like in the media discourses of Korea, like they're really proud of it and yeah, kind of sometimes in line with superiority kind of approaches to even. So um, it has the cultural effect as well here. And for the economic effects, um, as discussed before in other presentations, it led to like more buying behaviors of Korean products leading to economic benefits for Korea. And it also promoted tourism into Korea in economics. And so, but then, since it's so in line with Korea's national interest, it kind of got the backlash from East Asian countries as in the form of anti-Korean wave. So they were like really criticizing the hegemony of it. And then so the sustainability of Korean wave was, was questioned because um, it used to be like Hong Kong's cultural products and Japanese cultural products really popular in um, East Asian region, but then it ended somehow. So it might happen the same thing for the Korean wave. So everyone was starting to talk about sustainability of Korean wave after this phenomenon appeared. So um, I'll talk about more in detail later. And for my research question, it uh, starts with um, Korean wave and public diplomacy um, relations. And also like the, what the Korean actors did after anti-Korean wave happened to um, um, deal with the problem. And then what were the results of such um, efforts by the actors in Korea with dealing um, against um, anti-Korean wave? And I was wondering if the results really differed according to the context. But then there was like relatively not that many studies done in field of um, after what happened um, anti-Korean wave. There was many identifications about um, well, why anti-Korean wave happened, but then like there was not that many things about what really did change and then um, what were the results of it. So um, um, my methodology would be comparative case study for explanatory objectives um, in the case of China and Japan. And I'll do documentary analysis of pre previous studies and content analysis of how the Korean cultural products are designed. And, um, and I'll do it um, focusing on production of Korean cultural media products affected by the environment, and I won't really discuss about audience reception or surveys. Uh, so my part two is um, dealing with how the Korean um, companies and the government collaborated to make this new cultural public diplomacy initiative to target against anti-Korean wave. So I'll start with the development process of anti-Korean wave in China and Japan and discuss about the design and we'll try to evaluate how the cultural PD initiatives were um, good or effective in terms of um, the um, discourse theoretical framework for the new public diplomacy.
So um, for the chronological development of Korean wave in China and Japan, at, at first, um, early 1990s, like Korean government also saw the potential of um, this Korean wave because um, it was not the widespread, but then this one movie called Sokyeonze got kind of international acclaim in the um, movie festivals. So like the Korean government suddenly saw the potential and then they collaborated with the Jaguars in Korea to boost the industry. But then the Jaguars kind of backed up after the Asian financial crisis, but then not all of them left the industry, but many remained, and the talented people with really fancy MBA degrees remained in the industry so to make it really more scientific and really like enterprise kind of approach rather than just mom and pop entertainment business. So um, this is the, this led to the um, kind of start of Hallyu in China in late 1990s. And so the Korean wave started in China, and the Korean wave itself was named by Chinese media. Um, and <clears throat> later on, in early 2000, um, Hallyu started in Japan for the first time with the uh, Winter Sonata's popularity. And in the mid 2000s, the appearance of anti Hallyu kind of appeared um, really simultaneously in China and Japan leading to stagnation of Hallyu and actually the exports of Korean um, media products declined at this time. So, um, for example, the Chinese state just imposed um, regulations on quota system. So it had to decline because of these anti-Korean wave movements. But then in late 2000s to early 2010s, for like 10 years, um, the Korean media industry and government really made this new kind of approaches to target against um, anti-Korean wave movements, and then it really worked for a short time in both countries. So, for example, like these Chinese members are in SM entertainment, like these idol groups, and we can see the drama Iris, which is a Korean drama, but then it made it's made with Japan's TBS broadcasting um, network. So. It really had this kind of two-way cultural exchange kind of thing, formula for a new cultural diplomacy. But then um, the developments in two countries later on changed because Japan, it kind of had um, adverse effects after all. And the China, in China case, um, it got really more popular with, as we talked about, Descendants of the Sun was so popular, My Love from the Star was so popular too, recently. And so I'll t talk about what kind of um, PD initiatives were done to make it successful to revitalize the industry. So for example, entertainment companies, they embarked on both content-wise and assets-wise changes because um, they really need this to um, survive in the economy. They, if, if Korean uh, market is so small that they cannot survive on the Korean market alone, so they really try to take the um, audience um, reception and what they really want from the Korean media products. So they changed to incorporate more foreignness into their cultural products in terms of content. And also they tried to assess um, the foreign public better by um, collaborating with the local companies there to um, increase the potential. And for the Korean government side, it didn't really directly involve addressing foreign publics, but then it addressed um, these media people, um, and then like they gathered them around and emphasized the need for the two-way symmetrical exchanges of cult culture so that it can be um, sustained, the Korean wave can be sustained, and they had like educational sessions for the media personnel on the cultural differences in other countries. And so, um, but as um, previous presentations mentioned, it's kind of fragmented to a certain extent because like there's so many agencies involved for this um, project, but then they clearly have the same vision of two-way cultural exchange. So yeah, it has the same vision, though still fragmented. And um, for the access-wise perspective, since Chinese government tried to uh, impose regulations, they had made uh, more um, state-level exchanges with China because um, um, they have FTAs with China and trying to have more agreements on content business to target against the regulations imposed on Korean um, cultural products. 
So um, I'll evaluate the um, approaches done by both media companies and Korean government um, from the theoretical framework for new public diplomacy, um, which was um, discussed by um, Dr. Ahyan and Professor Lee's article. And so it will um, talk about why do we need non-state actors in public diplomacy. And um, in terms of relation of PD, it's like um, it's really important to have two-way symmetrical um, model to listening to the public and then really taking into their um, interest into account during the engagements. And for network PD, it, it, it says that the private sector has to um, tap into those areas that government cannot do and for the credibility and reach to the foreign publics. And lastly, for collaborative perspective, um, the government should not be trying to be too strong in like um, designing the public diplomacy programs to um, break, like ruin the identity of the uh, non-state actors. So um, we'll see if the Korean government really did it well or not. Um, so my evaluation of the Korean um, PD program was Actually, it was quite well designed just in the context of um, media industry because um, the relational PD was really attempted because, as I said before, like the media industries really needed these economic gains, and so they have so much like audience researches, and then they just resulted in localizations. So um, maybe it's not like really proportionally symmetrical, but then it's much better than before. So we can say relational PD was taken into account. And secondly, for network PD, um, um, there was um, effective engagement with foreign publics because the government kind of indirectly um, engaged with the foreign publics, whereas the um, entertainment companies were the main actor to promote and design all the contents for um, Korean ways. And lastly, um, collaborative PD was pretty good as well because the Korean government really didn't um, try to um, just ruin the private company's um, objectives of profits, but just really stood behind and then did this government level engagements rather than um, directly targeting the foreign publics. So it, um, really went for the value added in the partnership, I think. And I'll talk about what happened after all these approaches were made, both in China and Japan, really big markets for Korean entertainment industry. And this show, the pictures show the uh, most recent kind of um, popular cultural products in both countries. And for the Chinese case, the My Love from the Star, it was um, just really Korean cultural products with Korean actors and everything. But then what they changed is they attempted that the online distribution of contents, which was um, not attempted before, but then it kind of got over the state regulations on the broadcasting system. So they had reached the Chinese public a lot and then um, led to the popularity. And for the uh, Japanese case, it's called the movie is called Sayonara Isuka. It's like in 2010, when before the anti-Korean wave got really, really big now. So um, it does not show any kind of Koreanness in the movie. It's totally um, with the Japanese actors and actresses, and it's based on a Japanese novel. And the setting is in Thailand, but then it, all the actors in the um, characters in the movie are Japanese, which showed um, this localization approach for Korean entertainment companies, and it actually scored like 10 times more audience um, in Japan than the previously popular Korean movies. So it showed the um, importance of localization, and I'll talk more in detail from now on. Um, so the nature of anti haryu in China and Japan was really different from the other because um, as we see in the Chinese character written right next to the countries, it was different um, meanings from the start. So in Chinese case, it means that um, this rebelling against the pervasiveness of Korean cultural media products. So this same Chinese character is used when they were 
like fighting against Imperial Japan before, and so it's like rebellion kind of um, um, context. And in Japanese case, it's like more of a despising Korea beyond just beyond like cultural media products. It's more broad issues um, engaging in Korea. And um, actually, in Japan, it started with a comic book, but then it got really more uh, audience on the online communities, which made it so much bigger right now. And for Chinese characters, um, the main incentive of the anti Hayu was in economic side because they wanted to protect the, their own media industry because their media industry did not really develop well before and it's currently developing now. And so they wanted to protect um, the industry from being dominated by Korea. And for Japanese case, it's already a developed nation where Korean entertainment companies actually learn from. So it was more in the um, perspective of culture where like resentment against this inferior Korea was catching up Japan, according to these ultra right wing sectors. And so, um, and for the main actor was in Chinese case, government imposing on regulations which made a top down approach. But then in Ch Japanese case, I'll say civil society with the parent system because it's, I, I cannot really know if it's a real NGO because they're doing hate speeches against um, racial discriminations and everything. So I'm not really sure if it's a real civil society, but Japanese traditional media calls it civil society, so I put it on like that. And um, the process was bottom up, and the triggering factor was not regulated by the state, but it was collective action by these citizens um, gathering again. So um, actually, state political power was um, really um, leading to the um, online of, of Public in the um, Chinese case, but then in Japan it was more like the political action gaining political power later on. Um, so focus on the Korean PD uh, initiative deferred in two contexts because the um, nature deferred in two contexts in China. So um, they really tried to support the Chinese media industry with expertise transfers and um, meeting the regulation requirements of the states rather than um, just like cultural kind of um, approaches in Chinese case. So it was more in the economic side, whereas in Japan it was like showing respect for contemporary culture, etc. Makes it um, more like a cultural approach in targeting anti korea -based. And so results differed in China and Japan, which made it um, largely overcome in China because they targeted the access problems um, and then the state regulations were overcome. But then in Japanese case, it was um, marginalization of Hayu because um, this um, misunderstanding of core the problem for Japanese public was made by the Korean side because it was not just about Korean wave and media products, but it was more um, extensive wide areas covering all kinds of uh, diplomatic relations between the two countries. So um, but this um, state level diplomacy um, role was different as well. So it showed um, different implications from the cases too. So um, I'll talk about also the, actually even though I focus only on the context, I think there is a role that Korean domestic audience played as well because Korea has nationalism a lot too. So it makes it a news media framing on how you really in a nationalistic way of economic gains and culturally like superiority or something. And then for the online communities, it was like, there's like cyber warfare going on with Japanese on um, these right wing groups. And then these hostile online comments are always um, posted and when, whenever it's like, even though it's an like irrelevant cultural um, exhibition, there's like always these um, really hostile comments. So which makes it um, showing that domestic audience actually kind of play the role in making of the anti Hayu rather than just about the foreign country societal aspects. And so um, lastly, actually, not only in the Chinese and Japanese case, but there are other contexts when um, Korean wave got these diplomatic kind of problems in the end because um, for um, this, this young 16 year old girl who's like in K pop group, she, she just waved her Taiwanese flag in Korean a TV show, and then it got so much uh, frustration from Chinese public and then affected 
also Taiwanese election recently. So Korean media did not really attempt to really get into diplomatic relations at all, but then it just had to be somehow involved in there. So um, these kind of cases show how um, Korean way respond to meet with this um, anti-Korean way kind of response and diplomatic relations problems. So for implications for public diplomacy, wrapping up my study is that Hallyu as public diplomacy shows a blend of all these political, economic, and cultural factors. So it calls for interdisciplinary research, as I thought. And also the cultural PD areas cannot really be separated from traditional diplomacy issues as we have seen in the anti-Korean wave phenomenon. So um, it also involves domestic politics and audiences as important stakeholders. And also the, um, since the results so much differed in China and Japan, we have to do more context specific research I thought in the area of public diplomacy. And for um, the future of Korean wave, I thought that it has to go beyond national interest for survival in East Asian region. Thank you for listening.